I think there's a lot more work to be done, especially with everything that's currently happening due to the coronavirus and um, the Asian hate right now that we're seeing come up in the news um, in America. It's like when you are okay that something is there, but you're not happy about it. So it's like maybe that whole Asian people are okay to be around, but now that there's a reason to, for us to not be okay with it, we should arc up. That is an issue. That is a major issue. This week on Dirty Linen, we continue to talk about anti-Asian racism, discrimination, and I've brought into the conversation someone who I just, I love for his energy and all the different hats that he wears. And when I say hats, actually, it's quite often literally. Um, Khan Ong, welcome to Dirty Linen. I am going to get you to do your own introduction because there is just so many things I could say about you. I just don't even know where to start. So take it away, baby. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. So I'm Khan for the listeners at home. I am a cook, a presenter, an author. I used to be a DJ. Um, that's kind of it. Right now I own the George on Collins with my business partner and that's kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, you do so many different things. And what I love about it, I mean, I see you mostly on social media, but I just, when one of your photos pops up, like it's so, there is just so much heart and energy and gorgeousness and I don't know, just just (laughs) great great textures. And I just feel like you bring your whole heart to everything that you do. Thank you. That's very, very sweet. Like, look, um, Instagram is like my socials is something that I kind of take seriously. Like we always shoot the food properly with a photographer, sometimes with a stylist and things like that, just because I kind of want the food to come across how I enjoy it. And I find that when I do it by myself, the lighting's never right. The food doesn't look as good. So it's better just to get people in to take those photos for you. Mm. Well, I mean, I also think the photos of you on your socials are just just, I don't know, just really striking. Like, I don't know, uh, I, there's, a, there's a lot of fashion and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a look, but there's just, yeah, as I say, it's just there's heart. I just feel like what you put out there will mean a lot to a lot of people. And I, get, I suppose I'm, when I, I'm thinking about people who perhaps don't see themselves represented as much in our society as, as they should. So I'm thinking of um, gay men. I'm thinking of Asian men. I'm thinking of, um, yeah, Asians working in food and, uh, and in the media. I just think there is, yeah, there, there's just so much good stuff that you bring to this world. Thank you. This is really sweet. Like we started this interview and all you've done is said nice things about me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But <laughs> yes, we should have had we should have had a coffee first and I could have got all this out should could have got all my gushing out of the way. But I think it's important. I think it's important. Um so Khan, a lot of people would have first encountered you when you were on MasterChef. So I think it was twenty eighteen that you went just about all the way, right? Yes, I um, came third in 2018, so season 10. And then you were back for the All-Stars season through that that funny old year that we had last year. And, and MasterChef was such a bright spot in the year. I think it was so nice to see something that was a little bit normal. And, of course, COVID definitely snuck its way in. There, were, there, were, there was a, a long period without hugs. Um, and, yeah, the, those, yeah, this... Uh, yeah, it was really, it was actually really emotional. And I think the presence and prominence of um, people of Asian heritage on the 2020 MasterChef season was was really notable and striking. Of course, we had um, Melissa Leong who came on as a host and um, she just really brought it. And uh, there was a, a lot of um, Asian Australian contestants. Um, and there was this this moment um, in a challenge where it was all Asian people in the challenge. And um, I would just love you to talk about that moment because I know that uh, Melissa called it out as like a, as a, as a real moment of representation. So in that challenge for me, it was, I think it was a fairy tale challenge where there was like five of us. And I think it was myself, Poe, Reynolds and Jess, maybe there was four of us. Um, That was wild that was like at the time when you're in a challenge like that you're not really thinking about who's in it with you you're just kind of concentrating on doing your best and it wasn't until i viewed it afterwards that 
I really understood that that was a moment. Um, I grew up in Australia, but I never would have seen anything like that where there was like a whole, like a judge and also all the contestants be of Asian heritage. So that was absolutely crazy for me. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, you said this, this wasn't something that you would have seen as you were growing up. Can you talk about, um, whether you think that made your path more difficult, did you feel like the you know you couldn't that there were dreams you had that perhaps weren't accessible to you? Was yeah, I I, I don't even think it's like a dream. Like I ne- like I would never have even thought about being on a television show or being in the media because that was not the norm for me. That was not what I saw. That's not what I like when I turned on my TV. That's not what I that what was on the screen. So that that was never even like a thought that went through my head it kind of all just happened and I think that now we're seeing so much representation on tv and especially on a show like Master Chef, where I think that it's not it's representation but not tokenism um and I and I, I say this all the time that like everyone who is on Master Chef is there for a reason they're there because they can cook and food always is the forefront of all the judging it's not Oh, let's like I actually thought this way back that I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I'm an, a gay Asian male. I'm going on Master Chef. I'll be fine for a couple of rounds. And literally, the first season I went on, I was told to do something, or else you're going to go home. And I was like, whoa, this is definitely a food show. And that's what I loved about Master Chef that we were there not as tokens. We were there to kind of improve and learn and become better cooks. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how it should be, right? I mean, it's, I don't know, I, I guess I, it makes me think about quotas and there's so much discussion about quotas when we're talking about fe- um, female representation in politics at the moment. Um, and it is a, it's a topic that sort of um, some people struggle with. It's like, shouldn't people be there on their own merits? But on the other hand, there needs to be, I think, some positive discrimination to create pathways for people who perhaps um, weren't able to see them before. So I don't know, I'm sort of thinking out loud because I can definitely see a case for it in politics that there should be, um, women should be elevated. But yeah, what do you, what do you think? Look, I, th- I totally understand. I see where you're coming from just because I think that the whole discrimination, like growing up, it's kind of in you subconsciously it's in you because you of your surroundings and things like that so when it goes into jobs when it goes into the workplace it's not even a people trying to discriminate discriminate against other people or races or genders but it's just something that has become the norm so i understand what you're saying when you're saying that positive discrimination may be needed just kind of change that to change that whole idea to change that kind of viewpoint i guess it's like if the playing field is level then you, you don't need any you don't need any quotas but i guess it, the, the playing field isn't level and hopefully what people such as yourself are doing is is leveling that playing field as you strike a path for yourself um can i'd love to go back to the beginning tell can you tell us about your early childhood so um, my parents came to Australia as refugees. They were in a refugee camp for four years in Indonesia, and I was born two years into that four years. So I lived on an island called Galang that I have no recollection of um, whatsoever, and I came over when I was about two. Um, my parents lived with um, family basically for the first three or four years of moving to Australia. Um, Mum worked as a seamstress, dad as a butcher, and then I think it was like... When I was about 11 or 12 was when dad decided to start his own small business. So they started a butcher together. Mum kind of was, mum was working at the butcher, but also at night she was um, still sewing. She was making samples for um, big Australian designers and things like that. So my family's always worked hard, um, which I'm very, very grateful for because I feel as though if they didn't kind of make those sacrifices to come to Australia, I probably would never have had the life that I currently have slash or be born. <laughs> um, yeah. So I grew up in Springvale, which is a very, very Vietnamese area. Um, so for me, going to school, I was surrounded by Asian Australian people. So I never really kind of felt out of place until possibly until I was like 16, 17, because after high school, I went to 
um, Halebury, but it was in Keysborough, which means there was a large um, amount of Asian people there as well. And then I went to Melbourne High and then I went back to Halebury. And it wasn't until after leaving high school and doing, so I, after, uh, during high school, I did a fashion course at Melbourne School of Fashion after hours. So Monday to Wednesday, I did like a little diploma in um, garment construction and pattern making. And that's kind of when I was like, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit different. There's people that like, it's, yeah, it's just a little bit different. And then when I, when I started going, uh, when I, but then what really changed was when I actually became a DJ because I was in a nightclub and there was probably 10%, maybe 5% people that looked like me. Um, and I was and so g- growing up, I didn't have to f- feel as though I needed that representation around me because I grew up in areas where there were a lot of Asian people. But as I got older, that's when I started to notice the differences. Um, um, it was the nightclubs, the big one. That was like, it was kind of like not a spoken thing, but it was kind of, this is not a night for Asian people. Yeah, right. Do you know what I'm? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. like, like when you go out, people are like, "Oh, it's an Asian night," and I was just like, "I," and I was like, "Okay, well, that's a different like." So, what does that mean? Like, where am I playing? If that's like, "Oh, Friday night's an Asian night here," but you're playing on Saturday. So, what is Saturday if Friday night's the Asian night? Like, that's kind of when things started to irk me a little. Mm. So, I mean, when you say irk you, like, did you? was it just sitting there in you? Did you say something? Did you, I mean, did you go and see what Friday was like? I yeah, mean, no, was- definitely. I, I, it's like, it's a little joke that I have with um, a lot of my DJ friends. I was like, I don't understand why I never broke the Asian nights. Like I always went and I always went there, but I just never fe- felt like I fit in. And I was like, wait a minute, this is so strange because I'm like, we we speak to like a lot of the time I would speak to people there in Vietnamese and I'm like this is awesome but I never got booked there and it was kind of like because another night had me as their resident there was a line mm. that was like we don't share interesting and I just found that baffling yeah what about um I mean did you grow up knowing that you were gay from a very young age or was that something that you realized later in life like I, I definitely knew that I was gay uh, younger when I was a lot younger. I actually, I think I came out towards the uh, the beginning of high school and then I kind of went back in when I went to Melbourne High, the second high school I went to, just because it was an all-boys school and it was really academic-based and I was totally out of my, like, element. I I felt really uncomfortable there. Um, mum, <laughs> mum knows because I, I forced my way back to Halebury. I literally came home every pretty much every day just upset sad um sometimes crying um i never felt like i fit in i just, that was just not like i don't know it 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 was a strange situation to be in um and i kind of didn't feel like myself um and i don't would it took me a lot longer in my life to realize that might be a big because that i was like back in the closet i wasn't comfortable i wasn't out so i did my best went back to halebury um, I got a scholarship to go back to Hillary. That was the only way that mum would let me go just because like the, the price, the price difference, the school fees are just so astronomically different. Um, but when I went back to Hillary, I came out again and it was the best. I love that school so much. Um, it was supportive of everything I wanted to do. They were supportive of pretty much just me as a person. And they still are to this day. Like I still keep in contact with the alumni um, association like I, I love the school I could not say anything bad about Halebury like incredible um, yeah and I can, and I think that if I didn't go back to Halebury I wouldn't be the person I am today just because I would not be comfortable with myself um, mum mum my family were great they mum's different she's um, she's not your typical um, Asian mother where everyone thinks that Asian mothers are really strict and like <laughs> And um, being gay is not really a thing in Vietnam, but to her, it was just kind of like, yeah, cool. You're my son. This is life and whatever. <laughs> um, so I really always had that kind of support behind me, which I am so incredibly thankful for. It's incredible to think about these turning points in someone's life, you know, that, and it's amazing that you had the, I guess, the presence of mind or, or 
whatever it was that made you fight to go back to somewhere where you felt like you could be yourself. I mean, I just wonder how different your path would have been if you'd had to sort of, you know, squash yourself into a different mould um, to stay at a school where you felt that, yeah, you just couldn't, exp- you couldn't be who you were. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I feel as though I've always kind of done that. I think that if something makes me feel uncomfortable, I try to not do it. <laughs> and I feel like a lot of people at home should possibly do the same thing. Like if, if you don't like it, then why, why, why are you there? Why are you pushing along on this if it doesn't make you happy? And that like my schooling for that year did not make me happy at all. Mm. So, so you t- can you, you're DJing, um, yeah. on the Asian night, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've studied, you've studied fashion. Like tell us, tell us where your journey took you next. So, um, when I finished high school, I ran off. Um, my, my, my dad actually passed away when I was in year 10. Um, and my relationship with my mom after that was really strained. Um, so as soon as I turned 18, I pretty much packed my bags and flew to England, lived in Shoreditch in London, um, applied to go into St. George St. Martin's, one of the best design schools in the world, and was lucky enough to get in. And then I was there for six months and I hated it. Oh. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. I, I hated being cold. I hated not knowing anyone. I hated feeling kind of like an outsider always. Um, so I came back. I came back. Um, I came back and mum and I were starting to get to – um, like our, our relationship was coming back to normal. And um, I basically said, for this to keep going, I can't live at home. I can't live with you because that's probably what the issue was. So I, when I came back, I moved out and um, our relationship has gone from strength to strength since then. I see my mum and my sister every Monday, sometimes twice a week. Um, we cook together on Mondays. It's always the same phone call. She gets the call at about 10, 11 o'clock. What are you doing? What are you making tonight? Okay, you don't want to cook. I'll cook. Um, and it's always the same. And so, like, well, because mum, mum taught me how to cook. We, we, we had that just because she, um, her and dad were um, working so hard that the only time that we really had to bond was while she was making dinner. And I would always sit on the kitchen counter, I remember, in a corner. And if she needed me to pick leaves, like pick herbs, I'll do that. If she needs me to roll something, I'll do that. And we'll just chat. So food has always been the thing that really connected us. Yeah, beautiful. Um, what's a dish that you guys make together or what's one of one of her dishes that you just absolutely love? Okay, so mum has this, there's multiple. One is her spring rolls, which I don't even have the recipe for because she's like, no, that, they're not the good ones. And I was like, no, they are the good ones. <laughs> like you just don't understand that they're the good ones. Um, and she used to make them and freeze them in the freezer um, and just have them come out whenever she needed them. She doesn't do that anymore. She's just like, nah but she won't give me the recipe and I crave it. I crave it. It's a pork spring roll, but um, it's the ratio of pork to like spice and also carrot and taro. And I hated taro when I was really young, but eating the spring rolls made me love taro. And now I want them. She won't make them. <laughs> now I want them. <laughs> it's it's like it's it's so crazy that it's just like and like she doesn't have a recipe for them because I I'll ask and she's like no you just put carrots taro like pepper yep I'm like cool mine never tastes the same as yours though. <laughs> mm, those mum recipes I know right. So Khan, what um what happened next like what were you did you get more interested in cooking is that what took you to master chef like how did that come about so with the with the djing i i was a dj for about eight nine maybe ten years i toured asia i played for big um artists i i played after parties for justin bieber mari cyrus eminem um and i hated it <laughs> what <laughs> sounds like the dream <laughs> I, yeah, I hate. I absolutely hated. Um, I hated. I hated the expectation of having to be drunk. I felt as though I was the, a jester. If you kind of know what I mean, like I know that I'm there to entertain people, but it was kind of like, why was I not getting bookings unless I was drinking? And that was really what irked me. Like that really annoyed me, and it annoys me to this day. Like I, I love DJing. Like don't get me wrong, but I hated doing it as a career. Um, so I still play now from time to time when the like gig is fun and it's like for friends and things like that. Cause I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. But to do that three, four nights a week, um, it got old real fast. So I found that, um, throughout my whole life, I've held dinner parties, usually once a week, once a fortnight when I was younger, 
with my friends, I'll, they'll come over and I'll do like a feast of like five, six dishes. And it was just an ongoing thing that I've always done. I really enjoy it. Um, on weekends, if I am hungover, the thing that I do is I, I cook because I feel like I've achieved something. Um, and that makes me happy knowing that I didn't spend the whole day sitting on the couch ordering Uber Eats. Um, yeah. So towards the end of my DJ career, I um, a friend of mine was like, well, why don't you audition for MasterChef? And I was like, oh, no chance. And I'm not going to get on that show. Like, that, like that, they, they are incredible. Um, so I just didn't. And a girlfriend of mine actually sent through an application for me incomplete, knowing that because it's incomplete, it's going to have like, someone's going to be like, Hey, your application is incomplete. Can you complete it? So that came through on my mailbox and I was like, well, you've already done half of it. I might as well just finish the other half of the, um, the application. And, um, I did, and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I filmed a video where I was cooking like, um, a seafood pasta in my kitchen, flew for a gig in Bali, realized that I hadn't introduced myself. I hadn't spoken about the dish. I just cooked. Um, so I, on the other end, I filmed like a, um, a master's interview of me introducing myself and overlaying it over the cooking video. Um, yeah. So I was not ready. Love it. <laughs> I was not ready, but I was like, Oh, I should probably introduce myself at this point rather than you just watch me rip open a squid and like take the skin off. <laughs> And they obviously loved it. Yeah, they um. Well, they saw something in it. Yeah, I um. Yeah, I I I I was fortunate enough to get asked in to do a, like a a real face to face cook for some of the producers, and I I don't know if I can swear, but I fucked that up royally. Um, I cooked I cooked um I cooked a little Vietnamese slaw, and then I did like a a chicken with a garlic, honey, or oh, ketchup manis, um marinade on it but obviously high sugar levels in the oven the bottom of the drumstick burnt um brought it up to the producers at the time and i i knew straight away that like I, that this dish is not going to get me anywhere and before they taste it they're like is are you happy with your dish and i was like not really uh, um my my dressing needs balancing it's not acidic enough um i forgot to peel my well, I ran out of time, honestly, to peel the shell of my peanuts. Not the like the not the thick shell, but the little skin that sits on top. Like sometimes that's delicious if you like are roasting it and like it's coated in like a sugar or a um some sort something sweet or something sour or something. That's delicious. But this was just roasted peanuts. Probably should have peeled the skin. Didn't do it. Um, the top of my chicken gorge. The bottom end a little bit burnt. Maybe eat around it. <laughs> um, that's kind of what I said to them and um. I was like, no, no chance am I going through. And in that in that round of auditions, I was the only one that went through. And I I spoke to I spoke to um, one of the producers who's become my friend now. And I uh, was like, well, how did I get through that? And I you named every single thing wrong with your dish, and you knew how to fix it. And I was like, ah, oh, well, that's cool. So yeah, so that that got me through to judges, and it kind of. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to get to top 12 either after that. But, um, I mean, sorry, top 24, but I did. And first cook, I literally had no idea what I was doing. I was way over my head. Like, I like my depth. I was, like, out of my comfort zone. And I was just happy to make it that far. And um, about, I think about two or three weeks in was when I had that conversation with another producer. And they said to me, you need to do something or you're going to get eliminated. And, um, and that week I ended up winning two challenges and an immunity pin because I was so scared of going home. <laughs> I was just like, okay, um, I've got to ramp it up now. Cause I, like, I feel like when you're on MasterChef, there's 24 of you, even when there's like 17, you're like, oh, one out of 17 is going home today. That's not going to be me. So you kind of cruise and it isn't until someone kind of really attacks you or like tells you off that you're like, okay, it's time to get moving. And what did you find within yourself to like go to that next level? Um, I just didn't play it safe anymore. I think the challenge that the challenge that, um, the, my first challenge that I won was the first time that I had a tasting during a mystery box. So the judges had never asked me to come up to, to present my food during a mystery box because I just played it safe. Um, on that day I was in Adelaide and there was beautiful, beautiful, um, Kwondongs there. And I remember reading a book. I think it was in a bray, um, a recipe where the condoms were cooked a certain way in a syrup or some kind of juice to level out how acidic they are. And I was like, genius, like great book. Um, 
And so what I did was I, I, I looked at the challenge around me and I was like, okay, well, it's all about suppliers and um, farmers and producers in the area. So we've got Kwandongs. What will pair with that? Obviously, the Rue. And then I'm like, there's salt bush that just comes from the go- the coast. That there, those three things are the basis of my dish. Like, they, they would make total sense together. So at that point, I was like, okay, how do I – I've never used any of these ingredients before. How do I make this comfortable? And I thought, yeah, cool. We can make the kwandongs into – I will cook it off just like I read. So I cooked it off in some plum juice um, with the salt bush. I've, I've cooked steaks in rubs before. So with the t- salt bush, I actually just drenched it in vinegar, um, cooked it off in the oven, like so dehydrated, crushed it up, and then I actually rolled my cooked roux in it. And then – so it was like a salt and pepper – sorry, salt and vinegar roux, like um, – uh, so, so yeah like crust on the um kangaroo so it was on that day everything just worked it was like i was on i looked at everything i thought about it, how the food would go together and it made sense um and that's kind of how i started to look at all the challenges rather than being like let's cook something safe i was like let's cook something that you would be super proud of presenting Mm. and i love the way that you were thinking about it with these these kind of building blocks these these different elements and i suppose it's like the, all those things that you pointed out about your dish in the beginning, the the first one that that was um, that wasn't quite wasn't quite right. It's like you, you, it's those principles of cooking that you, I guess, you just learnt to apply them in a way that, um, yeah, that brought in a bit of flair and and a lot of cre- creativity and um, yeah, often often running. So um, obviously, you know, it you went almost to the end of that competition, you came out of um, MasterChef and you ended up becoming a restaurateur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's skip forward to that. What, can you talk about being a restaurateur and, and some of the things that you have encountered? So like, okay, so I came off MasterChef not thinking that I would ever have a restaurant and it just kind of, it just kind of, I don't know, things happened, conversations were had, deals were made and I was like, okay, I'm a part owner in this restaurant now, which... I love it's kind of a mixture of both my world. So it's food, but it's also, it's got a bar that stays open until three. So that nightlife aspect is there. So it was kind of perfect for me. And I found myself um, getting more and more involved, obviously, as the years went on. And now I am. now I'm like more of the back end of it. Um, The management side Um, on, on operation days, I'm, actually like I'm on the front desk I'm basically the maitre d'. I'm the person that like seats everyone and makes sure that we can shuffle things around especially with COVID when we our numbers were restricted it was really like we needed to get people in and out at certain times um to make well business work basically and um look the whole racism in the hospitality industry is I don't think it's something that people do on purpose but it happens like for example when i'm standing at that front desk it's happened to me multiple times where if i'm like i'm sorry but like the we've we're completely full um i can find you a table in half an hour that kind of thing someone will always say to me oh can i speak to blah 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 and i'll be like sorry um um i don't know who that is and they'll be like your boss and i was like oh you mean the manager of my restaurant who also you've said their name wrong. Um, um, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, and I look at them thinking, you've just tried to go over my head on something that is not changeable and is like, and I, I can't, I can't kind of like, I think it's because I'm a young Asian man standing at the front desk. <laughs> not like you, they don't expect that I own part of the business. And so it's like, no, no, I'll speak to, yeah, yeah, someone else. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's infuriating. There are days when I know we're in hospo and we can't just get angry, um, but there are days when I'm standing at that desk and I was like, oh, my God, that was the rudest person that I've ever encountered in my life. And it's like I don't expect people to, like, know who I am or what I do, but I just expect people to be nice and respectful because when I go to a restaurant, I don't do things like that. I'm like, okay, cool, well, it's a half an hour away. I'll just drink at the bar. Like, that's fine. Like, it's never, oh, my God. Sorry, I get very, um, I get ranty about this. Well, understandably, because it's like someone's trying to go over your head, can I speak to the manager, can I speak to the owner? Well, hi, I am the that's owner. That's me. I mean, do, yeah. you, do you say that to them? Like, you're, you're, this is as high as you can go, actually. 
there's there, there was only one time that that happened because like usually if they ask me to speak to my our, our venue manager name's Maud if someone's like um can I please speak to Maud then I'll be like no problems Maud can deal with it because she'll probably she usually just goes well Khan has final say like she really like usually directs it back to me anyway but there was a guy that was just super rude and he literally turned and went you know your boss and I went actually I am the boss it's my venue. And that was the only time that I ever did it, but I was just like fuming at that point. And but that also makes me realize how people are spoken to in Hospo and how possibly our staff is treated, are treated. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's never okay, right? It doesn't. No, it it doesn't matter. Like I I could be like I could be a waiter, I could be a busy. It doesn't matter. Like you ask things in a polite manner, and you'll receive it. So, I mean, where to next, Khan? Like. Do you feel like there's still work to be done? Do you feel like you, you're you're doing the work just by being there, doing what you do? Like where to where to next? Do you think? I look. I think I think there's a lot more work to be done, especially with everything that's currently happening due to the coronavirus and um, the the Asian hate right now that we're seeing come up in the news um, in America. That says a lot. That says that maybe it was all just what's the right word for this? The people were kind of just uh, like, oh, I need to find this word. It's like when you are okay that something is there, but you're not happy about it. So it's like maybe that whole Asian people were okay to be around, but now that there's a reason to, for us to not be okay with it, we should arc up. That is an issue. That is a major issue. So you're saying that there is sort of residual racism or well, it's sort of brewing there under the surface and then what people feel like they're given an excuse to let it arise or like a, a, an excuse yeah, well yeah because like we're seeing we're seeing it a lot in the news right now and and like I don't I don't think that it's gotten to as bad in Australia but it's really sad and it's really angering to watch a 60 year old Asian Chinese grandma get hit on the street for no apparent reason. Yeah, which is stuff we've seen coming out of the US. There's been a lot of incidents reported of, um, yeah, like just outright violence. Um, it's so, it's, I mean, it's so distressing. It's, it's super distressing. And I get it. Like people do it because they are scared, but that's still not an excuse. It's the same way that people reacted towards Muslims when September 11 happened and all of the, those things. It's, it's people react out of fear, but it's still not okay to do so because it wasn't, it wasn't anyone's fault. Like a virus, like a global pandemic is no one's fault. Mm. I think it shows that, I mean, you know, with the leadership in the US, I mean, Trump was so explicitly anti-China and I think I think what it shows is that when society is, is stressed and I suppose there's always people in society who are, you know, going through their own battles and susceptible to, um, to uh, having scapegoats and having enemies created for them and then they'll act out on, on that fear um, and that sort of manufactured anger and righteousness. I think we're, we're susceptible to that in Australia as well. Um, and we've certainly had, you know, political leadership and, and other voices in society, um, columnists, right-wing columnists, that sort of thing that, that um, bring out the worst in people rather than helping steer people towards, towards the good that's in them. I think that at the end of the day, it's about learning, it's about respect, and it's about kind of just understanding each other. Like there is no us against them mentality. There shouldn't be. That that shouldn't be a thing. It, we should just be humans. Um, and the, even the fact that we're having this conversation is infuriating. Like it's like it shouldn't be something that needs to be spoken about, but it does. And like that in itself is a problem. Yeah, it is. I mean, I feel like I, I've... In, within myself, I feel like I've got a lot of layers to this conversation because I also feel like um, I wish this wasn't something that was there to be spoken about. Um, but we need to. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's just the reality of it. And, like, I appreciate you for even, like, having this conversation with me because I think these conversations are definitely needed um, for us 
as people to grow. Yeah, I think so too. And I'm really grateful to you for, for um, bringing your perspective to it. Um, yeah, I think it's it's got to be about understanding and empathy and compassion. And as you say, realising that there isn't an other, that we are all um, here, um, you know, living on this world together. We're trying our best. <laughs> We're literally all just trying our best. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it's it's just... It's one of these issues that, like, it's not the majority of the time. Like, I don't feel like this the majority of the time. There are days where I go into work. There are months where I go into work and everything is incredible. People are great. Customers are, like, amazing. And it just runs smoothly. But then all it needs is that one bad experience for me to be like, oh, shit, this still exists today. In 2021, this still exists. Mm. Yeah we got to break it down. And I guess one of the things that's come out of these conversations I've been having over the past week or so is everybody is empowered to sort of start where they are and create a little bit of change. And just as, you know, negative things have ripple effects, definitely so do the good things. Yeah. Look, I, um, I, I think you're across this. Uh, restaurants using um, uh, Asia, like well, I don't know how to say this. Um, restaurants using language that was a very stereotypical kind of a caricature of an Asian person's language, even the fonts used, so things like that. That all, I think, also needs to change um, just because well, you're, th- that's kind of selling an image of culture that isn't correct. Yeah, Um well, we've we've um, had on the podcast yesterday Yvonne C. Lamb from Gourmet Traveller, um, the digital editor of Gourmet Traveller, who wrote an excellent article about racist restaurant names. And in in her fantastic article, she does talk about, yeah, that sort of, um, I guess that Asian caricature, that sort of flattening of Asian culture into some sort of, you know, whether it's 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 a font. It's stereotyping. It's, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a font or it's the wrong pronunciation of the the letters I N G. Like things like that. Um yeah. Well I, I, and growing up when you saw that, when I saw that at restaurants, I was like, okay, cool. Now when I see it, I'm like tone deaf. Like completely tone deaf. I guess that's it, Khan, isn't it? It's like, you know, you, you, people don't come to these conversations or these these issues and situations fully formed. We've all got work to do. We we can all keep learning. We can. There are some things that you know we just didn't. I guess you know some people might not have realised were um, offensive. Yeah, <laughs> some time ago. But now, as we we all learn how to think about these things and learn about the hurt that things can create then yeah we just always try to do better I mean and I'm I'm saying this to myself as you know it's like we're, we're all on a journey yeah no I agree I agree like I was gonna, I, I think we've spoken about this before off the podcast um there are things where I make food and I'm like is this offensive it, is me changing this or calling it this is that offensive should I not do that for example um the, the there was a whole last like a whole kind of trend last year of doing things that were tandoori, um, and so that extended to proteins, vegetables, whatever. But calling it tandoori something, but then usually a tandoori chicken, for example, it's called that because it's cooked in spices in yogurt in a tandoor. So if I'm not doing those things, can I still call that dish a tandoor, whatever protein or vegetable is like when 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 i'm making recipes i've i need to take a step back and look at that um i know that that becomes a very minute thing but if it's offensive to some people is it not worth it yeah absolutely and i think you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt you to think about that or to ask yourself that question and you know um i mean i guess you've also got something a story along those lines about barn me haven't you yeah, yeah. So the bun me thing it infuriates me. Um, seeing bun me salads, seeing bun me tacos, and I'm like, a bun me literally translate in Vietnamese to bread. <laughs> like it literally translates to those that. So if you don't understand that the dish itself is a bread dish, could you like, what are you really saying? Is it an appropriation of something that is just pop- popular? Because a bun me salad is is not 
that that doesn't exist. Like that's not a thing. Um, and I and I see it. I see it from time to time, and and I I chuckle because sometimes I'm like, wait, why do I just keep chuckling at this when it's like completely wrong? Or even the spelling of bun me. Um, I've actually come across a couple of really big chefs that spell it not correctly. They spell it um, B A H N, and it it annoys me as well. But then it's like, am I being precious? But then even the thought of me <laughs> thinking if I'm being precious kind of annoys me as well. And I'm like, wait, am I allowed to be pre- uh, precious about this? Yeah, I do. I can be. It's my heritage. It's my culture, and I want it to be represented properly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it, I, I, yes, you can be precious. <laughs> of course you can be. <laughs> no, I, I literally am like, I've just spent this whole 40 minutes ranting. <laughs> I'm like, I've said, just, I've just been angry this whole time. <laughs> I really don't, I really don't think you have been. I think you've been really illuminating and you brought a lot of light to issues that are really important, as well as sharing your um, really quite wonderful story. You've done You've done so much already, Khan, and I really can't wait to see what you do next and next and next and next. And, um, yeah, I'm really grateful to you for coming along today to um, share your perspective and your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's, um, yeah, really great. Is there is there any last words that you want to have to the world? Um, just be nice. <laughs> just be nice. Think about how the way that you act or speak affects other people um i think just take a step back i i obviously it's harder to do than say and i try every single day to do so but just be a nice person don't be a jerk it sounds quite simple (laughs) yeah just don't be a jerk (laughs) all right thank you so much khan thank you so much for having me babe this is dirty linen and i'm danny valent We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.